they may aim their might, machines with no purpose but to slaughter on sight. We are simply a bullseye. We are not men. We are not men. We are stones in a wall, a flesh defense against a crimson tide, foundations on bones of those who died. We are stones in a wall. We are not men. We are not men. We are your protectors. We are all that stands between you and they, and we will stand till the last day. We are your protectors. This is what makes us men. This is what makes us men. My name is Alan Cook, and the Automata Wars is my story. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a city. A city filled with ordinary people, bouncy debutantes dreaming of their first big coming out parties. Governesses minding willful children, ladies of fine standing keeping up appearances, ladies of somewhat less fine standing keeping up other things. In the city life goes on as it should, but where have all the young men gone? Gone to soldiers, everyone. Not quite everyone, some of them remain. Those whose particular skills are needed to maintain the war effort at home. The miners and the scientists and the politicians, and those with slightly more secret responsibilities, they're still here in the city, but the rest have gone away. Called to the fighting, to the front line. The home front told the story of those left behind in the city, of those who thought they were safe. The home front told the story of how those remaining found that the war was closer, so much closer than anyone thought. Of the terrible things the enemy were prepared to do, and the terrible weapons they were prepared to unleash in order to win. It told the story of how the city dwellers tried to play their part in the war, to rally against the unimaginable horrors that assailed them. The front line, though, tells the story of the soldiers. What is a war without its soldiers? The soldiers, the young, untested, half-trained and clueless soldiers, torn from their homes, armed, badly, and aimed toward the enemy. The soldiers facing mutilation and mud, death and disease, and weapons and women. Women? We'll come back to the women. This is a war fought against an unknown enemy, an enemy who cannot be reasoned with or bargained with or even surrendered to. An enemy who seem intent on nothing more than the extinction of the population, as calmly as you might pour a kettle of boiling water onto an ant nest. An enemy, you might say, who absolutely will not stop. I think. And as a result, a war that the soldiers are losing quite comprehensively. And what are the women? What part do they have to play in this war? In the home front, we met Madame Jewel and her coterie of high-class um, working girls. It seems they have a bigger role, so to speak, than might otherwise have been imagined. The mysterious Madame Jewel herself seems to possess far more influence than might have been imagined for one of her position. Through some of her machinations, the war on the home front may have subsided a little for now, but can she influence the war on the front line? The officers have doubts, as their personal journals reveal. Excerpt from the personal journal of Field Marshal Cheshire. There's a long way to go and it's getting longer. The fuss at home seems at least to have died down a little now. It seems that woman managed to give the enemy a bit of a drubbing, beat them at their own game, so to speak. They've crawled off to lick their wounds. Unfortunately, they didn't lick them for quite long enough. We thought we had made a breakthrough. The woman, Madame Jewel as she styles herself, insisted that the mining effort she had put in place had reaped dividends, that the ore they had discovered would solve all our problems. She was practically salivating behind her veils, rubbing her hands with glee, as if, her, as if it had been her idea from the start. The war, she said, was ours for the winning. It certainly seemed like it at first. It's nasty stuff to look at, nauseating almost. 
Sidney was foolish enough to touch it. He said it felt nasty. Poor Sidney. He's dead now, of course. Caught the blasted trench melody, and that was that. So we trialled this all, and it worked. Fashioned into projectiles, one hit on enemy weaponry took the machine apart, no matter how big they were. The tide had turned. We even managed to push them back through the lines, regain some of the ground we had lost. The sight of those walkers fallen, shattered on the ground. The burrowers frozen in the very act of digging, their monstrous blades stilled forever. It did the heart good. The men cheered. We could have won on morale alone. It transpires though that the enemy can adapt quickly. For a week, maybe two, we had the upper hand. Then almost overnight it changed. The projectiles stopped reaching their targets. Somehow, no matter how we propel them, the shot no longer touches the enemy. They have put something in place that deflects everything we fling at them, makes them fall short before they actually impact. It's very clever, like some form of shield that we can't see. I'm not sure why we thought they wouldn't have any defense. That woman's influence, no doubt. For now, the men's morale remains high. They wait expectantly for shipments of their new weapons to arrive, thinking that the war is all but won. But it won't be long before they realize that the new weapons aren't coming that the war isn't being won at all. And then, morale will be at its lowest ever ebb. Mine certainly is. Never say die though. That woman is still involved, and although she makes the hair stand on the back of my neck, it seems she still has plans. Machinations, more like. She is into everything. Not a dispatch arrives that does not have her fingerprints all over it. She has access to our privy councils back home, to our war councils here. I understand she even has the ear of Her Majesty herself. She is still hoping to salvage something from the Black Ore fiasco. They are sending another shipment, this time of the unrefined stuff. It is being brought by one of her agents. It's earmarked for fire battalion which has camp set up in one of the more stable areas near the front. There are tests to be done, she said. Tests on what? I have no idea. But we've had to send a bevy of hand-picked scientists to the location to carry out these tests. Let's hope nothing happens to them. The trenches are no place for soldiers, never mind civilians. They're as likely to die from disease as from enemy bullet. So now, we wait with bated breath to see what latest schemes will unfold and how they will actually benefit us. Not for too long, I hope, or none of us will have breath left to bait. Excerpt from the personal journal of General Poynton Simmons, Commander, Expedition Force, TAC 37 Army Group, holding at 2.15 miles from the front line. So, here we are again. Standing still. Will someone please explain what the bally holdup is? We were promised weapons. We were promised a victory. And what do we get? Walter Wall Fanny. Or the first aid nursing yeomanry to be precise. Women. Women and scientists. Which equate to about the same thing in my book. I really thought we were getting somewhere. I thought we had them. Whoever they are. On the run! I thought we had them scared. Scared? How can machines be scared? It's not like we've ever seen a real person. If all they ever do is send out their damned automated constructions to fight us, then how do we know if they're scared, or angry, or even slightly concerned? How do we know they're even there at all? What if they just set all these devices off to do their bidding? and are off somewhere having tiffin. We simply do not know. Of course, there was that wonderful discovery made on the Delta site back home. 
some machine or device or something, so I'm led to believe. No further details. Uh, the only reason I know as much as I do is because I still have some people who are loyal to me, who haven't had their heads turned by all these blasted women. It's all, it's all gone very quiet about that. After the initial hullabaloo, anyway, what exactly is, is so important that it needs to be kept from me, the commander of the expeditionary force? I blame that woman. I will not use her name. She has been given altogether too much influence over everything. Quite frankly, she makes my skin crawl. I'm very glad that she remains on home soil, even though her women keep popping up over here. I'd much rather deal with a whole battalion of her women, a battalion of the enemy even, than I would deal with her. I have never seen her face. I hope to keep it that way. The front line tells a story of the war from the point of view of the new recruit, Private Reynolds. It shares his confusion and his despair, his faith, or otherwise, in his commanding officers, and his journey from new recruit to wherever it takes him. And it picks up the story of Amethyst, one of Madame Jewel's ladies from her establishment in the home front, as she takes on a new uh, position in the war effort. It's not a kissing book. There are horrors in these pages. There is darkness, and for Reynolds, there is the confusion of not knowing what to do, not knowing what is expected of him, not knowing whether he could be responsible for getting his brothers killed. But war is dark and horrific and confusing. I'm going to finish by reading this passage from the front line. Private Reynolds has had his basic, his very basic training. Now he's shipping out across the water and onto foreign land for the first time, along with all the other raw recruits. A train ride will take them to near to the front lines, but the war and the automated killing machines might not be confined only to the line. It flew, they said. It spun through the air, circular in shape, sides sharp at the edges, at such speeds that it seemed to scream as it travelled. That was how it received its nickname, based on the blood-curdling wails that accompanied it. Nothing could stop it. It could cut through rock, and it could cut through bone with equal impunity. It could not be eluded, and it could not be reasoned with. It was a destroyer, plain and simple. How could it be here? They were nowhere near the lines yet. The train could only take them so far before the rest of the journey had to be made using other vehicles. The fighting was still miles away. Yet here, by the sound of things, one was. He looked out the window, one of a herd of frightened, jabbering men. They could see nothing. The countryside flashed past in a blur as the train puffed on. Trees, bushes, shrubs, all vague, indistinguishable shapes, but no sign of anything that could make that terrible noise. Up ahead, the steam whistle sounded on the engine as if it was replying to the approaching nightmare. Then, inexplicably, another squealing noise as the engine brakes were applied. Unbelievably, the train began to slow. Trapped like rats in a box, he thought, there was nowhere to go, no safe way off the train, no way to avoid the oncoming nightmare. Clearly, he was not alone in that thought. One of the other men in the carriage, a boy no older than he himself, forced his way from the press of people at the windows and to the carriage door. A redhead, his usual pallor, was augmented by the blood that had drained from his face. His eyes were black holes in his head. He was skinny and he was quick too. He'd thrown open the door to the carriage and was through it before any one of the other men had the chance to utter a word. For a moment they could still see him tumbling over and over on the ground, misjudging his landing from the still moving carriage. Then he was off. And as the train slowed further and finally ground to a halt, they could see him racing down the track, woolen coat flapping as his skinny elbows flailed and his skinny legs pumped furiously. There was a momentary hush in the carriage. Then all of the men were at the door, pushing and shoving, trying to fight their way clear of the carriage, wedged in a tangle of arms, legs and kit bags. Outside, the shrill squeal was suddenly frighteningly close. Overhead, something blocked out the light, filling the carriage with shadows. A hush descended over the men, now cowering away from the approaching darkness. The ground shook and the air sung and something massive moved past them. Immediately the shrill scream sounded, ear-splittingly loud as something else, smaller and incredibly fast, went by. Reynolds was still at his place at the window, pressed back by the crush, still fighting to get out of the doorway. He saw a huge object set down alongside the train. It was not a screamer, not from any description that he had heard before. 
This thing was like the giant foot of a gargantuan construction, shaking the earth as it landed. Another ponderously huge foot set down some distance away, shaking the carriage once more. Reynolds looked up. Whatever it was, it was truly massive. He could not see the top of it from his vantage point at the window. It simply seemed to recede into the clouds. But he could see a multiplicity of small arms that were fixed to it somewhere above, whirling through the air with high velocity. They seemed random, but there was clearly a pattern to their movement. There had to be for so many limbs to avoid entanglement. Each limb terminated in a rotating circle, edged with serrated teeth, spinning madly. It was from this multitude of spinning sores that the shrill shrieking noise emanated. The screamer was, perhaps, something far greater than the rumours had implied. Reynolds could not move. This thing was monstrous, but the sheer immensity of the construction filled him with awe. He could not speak or react or even blink, as almost casually, indeed, almost accidentally, as if the monstrosity simply had not noticed there was anything in its path. One of the rotating blades swung forward as part of its dance. The blade scythed through the head of the fleeing ginger-haired youth. Even as he raced down the tracks, he fell instantly in a pitifully small spatter of blood, half his head gone. The men in the doorway had also seen the bushing stopped or reversed. Now everyone wanted to get back into the carriage, as far away from the door as possible. Jonesy was almost gibbering in fright, trying to force Reynolds between himself and the window. Reynolds pushed the smaller man away, still looking through the window looking at the giant foot of the monstrosity that wielded those deadly rotating blades, watching as the foot began to lift again and as the direction of its travel became apparent. It's going to stand on the carriage, he yelled, suddenly realising. Everybody, move down the train! And on that cliffhanger, I'm going to leave you. I just want to thank you and give some thanks to Stephen C. Davis, who is, uh, you might be familiar to you from Reading for You Radio, the CPR show, and also as the organiser of Raising Steam, which is going to be in Reading in September. Uh, Dr. Agamemnon Wen, who is familiar f to you, hopefully, from uh, a short while ago. Um, and also Crimson Clock's very own Joe there for uh, taking part in this presentation. Thank you also to everybody who helped out with the book, uh, to Colin and Colin and Dave and Amanda for all their help. Uh, and especially uh, to, where's Ian? Yes, I think he's there. Yes, hello. Thank you to my military advisor. And also, a big thanks go to uh, the Last Line Publishing House, Jim and Joe over there, um, for making all of this happen, for publishing the Asylum Chronicles as well as the Automata Wars. They're here tonight, as you've seen, with copies of the book, so please don't forget to exit through the gift shop. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we've got birthright in just a few minutes. <laughs>